Welcome back to another punk punching, quarter munching, game dev crunching episode of What Happened, the investigative pop culture media show that cleans up the streets one troubled story at a time. On today's episode, we're going to be getting late 90s as all hell as we look back at the development history of not just one game, but an entire series. Therefore, tape up your fists and ready your weapons. It's time to find out what happened to Fighting Force. Before they struck glittering, ancient, forbidden gold with Tomb Raider, Derby-based core design had made a name for themselves with a number of eclectic titles going all the way back to their founding in 1988, and had the distinction of being the first British studio license to make software for the Sega Genesis. 1995 was an especially productive year, where they put out six different titles overall, with one of those being my beloved Skeleton Crew. So while the Tomb Raider team were in the hot, sweaty throes of development, core design leadership gathered up the remaining staff in an open brainstorming session where people were allowed to suggest or pitch anything their heart desired. This is where programmer Sarah Avery suggested making their own 3D beat-em-up for the Saturn, an idea that the rest of the team liked. Sarah and her co-worker Robert Cirillo leapt into development using technology from their previous Saturn title, Thunderhawk 2, as a base. During these early days, Core Design decided to actually approach Sega to see if they could use the Streets of Rage license, as it would likely give the title more visibility. Obviously, this didn't happen, and there's not a clear consensus as to why. Some accounts claim that Core Design were pushing for a multi-platform approach, insisting that this theoretical 3D Streets of Rage should also appear on the PlayStation. Sega, obviously having no interest in putting their franchises on competitors' machines, which would change in about five years' time, refused, and the whole deal went sour. Others have said that while Sega was interested, they actually had their own plans for a new SOR, and thus were not going to license it out to somebody else. And finally, more still have said that Sega actually had zero plans to resurrect the franchise and decline the initial pitch based on that alone. There might be a bit of credence to that last one, as Yuzo Koshiro and Ancient did pitch a Dreamcast entry with first-person elements back in 1999, but it was also rejected for whatever reason. So while using Axel, Blaze, or Wood Oak City was out of the question, Core just defaulted to the initial idea, make an all-new brawler that leveraged the awesome power of the polygon. An interview with Sarah Avery printed in the book The Minds Behind the Games, interviews with cult and classic video game developers, shared that, after the SOR idea was dropped, we didn't need to change the game much. To start with, it hadn't originally been designed to be SOR, just something of a similar vein, although Roberto did model and texture some of the SOR characters. Internally, the team were calling the game Judgment Force, as per an early leaked Saturn build from 1996, which was obviously changed to Fighting Force, which remained its final name up until its release date, except in Japan, where it was known under the vastly superior moniker of Metal Fist. Throughout 1997, Core's staffers, including Sarah Avery, were hyping up Fighting Force in magazines like Saturn Power, getting fans ready for all the bare-knuckle action. In one issue, Sarah had said they were looking at games like Tekken and Virtua Fighter for inspiration, and that each character, and I quote, would boast over 100 moves. Now, obviously, in the 90s, exaggeration, i.e. lying, was a normal part of the hype machine. But that number is, like, so ludicrously high, I'm not sure how you could justify it. And as it turns out, you really can't. Even if you combine the movesets of all four playable characters, you'd still not get close to 100 unique moves. So either this massive moveset was at one point planned but scaled back considerably, or the marketing department handed Avery a script filled with preposterous bullet points. Another feature that was talked about before release but never made it into the final game was an arena battle mode, which would let players duke it out in 1v1 matches. According to issue 114 of GamePro magazine, at least one of their writers got to play it before it was removed, so it wasn't as much of a uh, mistruth as the whole 100 moves per character thing. As for why it got the axe, well, I can only assume it was cut to make the game's deadline. 
The final result was a very safe 3D interpretation of the beat-em-up, and aside from being able to destroy background props and use them for weapons, it ignored a lot of the innovations and combat depth the genre had seen in games like Final Fight 3, Alien vs Predator, and Die Hard Arcade. Avery had been working diligently on the Saturn version for some time, but deep within Core and their new publisher Eidos, things were rapidly changing. The higher-ups saw that the PlayStation was fast becoming the undeniable market leader, wanted to make sure that their games would run and look best on Sony's juggernaut. Avery was assigned to the PlayStation version, while another programmer was put on Saturn duty to fill in for Avery. In another excerpt from the minds behind the games, Avery recalls having mixed feelings on this. I remember not being too happy about leaving my beloved Saturn to work on its rival, but I saw the swap as a fresh challenge, so it didn't take long for me to learn to program the PlayStation's MIPS CPU and Geometry Transformation Engine. But with the rise of the PlayStation, after a while, it was decided to drop the Saturn game completely and instead focus all our efforts on the PlayStation version. A sad day for me personally when I now look back, for it marked my departure from ever programming on a Sega console again. IDOS and Core Design then became something of a No Saturns Allowed Club, as they dropped all support for the machine by mid-1997, with their last effort being the totally well-remembered Swagman. It's therefore a little ironic in how Fighting Force was initially conceived, starting hopefully as a Saturn exclusive title based on one of Sega's own franchises, yet it didn't even wind up being released on a Sega console at all. Unfortunately, when the game drop kicked its way into stores in October of 1997, the critical reception was rip-roaringly mixed. While some outlets appreciated the simplicity of the concept and gameplay, others felt the beat-em-up was well past its prime, and that Fighting Force didn't advance the game in any meaningful way, which, if we're being honest, it really didn't. Commercially, though, things were a lot more positive. The game reportedly sold over a million units worldwide, so going by those encouraging sales numbers, it's clear that fans, no matter the territory, were into the idea of brawlers flexing their muscles in three glorious dimensions. Wow! Take a look at that! But even with Fighting Force becoming a commercial success, some big, some would say unneeded changes were coming to this burgeoning franchise. Before we get to the uh, hard conversation that will be Fighting Force 2, let's go on a brief side mission to talk about one more version of the original game that has its own bizarre history. In 1997, the Saturn port was a faded memory, but something did rise from its ashes, and that was Fighting Force for the Nintendo Ultra 64. IDOS showed off this port with a playable demo at E3 1998, which was a little curious as they had rarely supported Nintendo's consoles in the past. It should then not surprise you that they never actually shipped this version of the game. Now, I know why you're yelling at your screen and are about to type in the comments, Hey, Fat Skeleton, Fighting Force 64 did come out! Yes, it did, just under another publisher. After the E3 showing, neither IDOS nor Core talked much about the 64-bit version of the game for several months, and when they finally did, wasn't exactly good news. IDOS had dropped the game from its release schedule altogether, despite it being pretty much finished, with no concrete reason ever given as to why. This changed in February of 1999, when Crave Entertainment suddenly announced they would be publishing Fighting Force 64 later that year. IDOS still retained the franchise ownership, they just didn't want to front the cost to market and manufacture the N64 version, which is most likely just a very frugal business decision for a port arriving about 20 months after its original release. Were they concerned that FF64 wasn't going to sell enough units to justify its cost? Was there some beef with Nintendo? We may never know. But uh, yeah, back to Fighting Force 2. Do you remember when I said five to seven minutes ago that IDOS and Core took those, uh, eh, brawlers are kinda mid critiques to heart? Well, they weren't bluffing, and literally took out almost everything that made the first game a commercial hit. 
instead of adding more playable characters, super moves, a deeper combo system, co-op team-up attacks, or fleshing out character backstories, they did precisely none of that. Instead, they dropped the playable character count from 4 to 1, took out multiplayer completely, and moved the gameplay into more of an action shooter direction with some very light brawling elements. The tone and story also became a clandestine spy mission where one operative is sent in against impossible odds. Um, why? Well... The breakout success of both Metal Gear Solid and Tomb Raider likely had an impact on FF2's development, and I guess since the 3D brawler hadn't really caught on, IDOS and core producers wanted to chase the hottest trend, and there were few things hotter in the late 90s than Solid Snake. Oh, but hey kids, if, if you liked him, then get a load of Hawk Manson! Uh, Hawk Mans. In addition to the tone and story, the controls also saw a drastic change, with the general navigation feeling a lot more Croftian and with a bigger emphasis on firearms and pressing switches. Always a thrill. Now, despite it coming out with both a PlayStation and a bridge-mending Sega Dreamcast version, Fighting Force 2 did not achieve the same sales success as its predecessor. Not even close. In addition to that, since the first game was far from a critical darling, you can imagine how much better the sequel fared. Well, you probably can't, because it was even worse. Reviews were best summarized by Next Generation Magazine, who said, The very definition of a two-star game. Perhaps competent, certainly uninspired. Eidos and Core's business relationship then became increasingly more strained as the years went on. Tomb Raider's financial success exploded in a fast, almost unsustainable way, and the team grew sick to death of designing the same tombs and traps as they had to keep up with Eidos's yearly mandate. And as it turns out, their other releases, such as Ninja Shadow of Darkness and Hurdy Gurdy, didn't seem to reach acceptable sales numbers, so there wasn't much alleviation there. But it all comes down to one very specific game, and one that we've covered on this very channel before. The torturous and grueling development of Angel of Darkness had put Core's future on the edge of a knife, as the company was hedging almost all of their bets on its success. However, while that was going on, a new, much smaller team started concepting another project that would hopefully resurrect the one franchise outside of Tomb Raiding that had once netted core healthy sales numbers, a dark and edgy 2000s brawler known as Fighting Force 3. Taking into account the, uh, very loud feedback they got from Fighting Force 2, the team went back to its melee brawling roots, completely dispensing with the action stealth angle, thank you Jesus. According to Unseen64's report on the game, four playable characters were planned, Hawk, Mace, and Smasher from the original, along with a new face, Jill, who is going to replace Alana. Since it had now been a few years, Core based the game style and look on the gritty gangster-based games that were flooding the market, so it was shaping up to be more Death Jam and less Streets of Rage. It was a hell of a lot more violent too. You could impale enemies on background hazards, or light them on fire, or throw them into oncoming subway trains. The team had put together a playable demo between 2002 and 2003, and were aiming for release on the PS2 and Xbox, with the GameCube apparently not outside the realm of possibility. The team estimated that Fighting Force 3 would need roughly another full year of development before it was ready to be unleashed. And given this type of game's popularity on the PS2 and Xbox at the time, it might have had a shot at propping the studio's doors open for a little while longer. Fate, it seems, had other plans for the team, because once Miss Croft was escorted off the premises and into the shiny offices of Crystal Dynamics, many core staff members, including Sarah Avery, left to form a new startup named Circle Studio, which would also be based in Derby. Those that stayed behind at core unfortunately grew unmotivated and progress on Fighting Force 3 stalled out. The absolute final nail in the coffin, though, was the complete apathy the gaming world had towards Smart Bomb, a PSP puzzle game that I've never heard of before. This was Core Design's very last title before being bought by Rebellion Developments, renamed to Rebellion Derby, where they released one final game, um, Rogue Warrior, 
Black Razor, whereupon they were completely shut down in 2010. As of today, the rights to Fighting Force remain at IDOS. I'm sorry, I mean Square Enix. I'm sorry again, I mean the Embracer Group. So while I very much doubt a revival is happening anytime soon, in the realm of the beat-em-up, it's had one of the wilder stories I've ever seen, and there is no telling where it could have gone. Had they simply enhanced what was already there for the sequel, maybe made a sprite-based GBA spin-off, and had gone on to make that gritty urban 2000s brawler, Fighting Force might have had more of a fighting chance. If you know of any other video games, consoles, or movies that fought wave after wave of problematic perils to their last dying breath, drop me a line in the comments below or enter the weapon-strewn alleyway that is my Twitter. And if you're fancying some more inside baseball stuff about uh, video games, hit the link in the description to check out the Minds Behind the Game book series. Some fascinating stuff in there. See you next time, and thanks for watching!